Welcome to Mod Path Chat, the official podcast of modern pathology, featuring interviews with authors and experts on the latest science, technology, and developments in the field of pathology. Your host, Dr. George Netto, is the editor in chief of Modern Pathology and the chair of pathology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Here's Dr. Netto. Welcome to Mod Pass Chat. Our guest today is Dr. Gladell Panner, Professor of Pathology and Urology at the University of Chicago. Gladell is a prolific scholar with over 130 original publications and great contributions to the development of GU practice guidelines. That's his interest, especially lately. He currently leads the CAP Cancer Protocols Panel for GU Tumors. So if you have any qualms or issues with the checklist that you have to fill every day, Dr. Panner is your person to go to. Gladell and I will be discussing his recent publication in Modern Pathology on a controversial area of flat urothelial lesions, namely hyperplasia, dysplasia, atypia of unknown significance. Uh, what is the situation with these terminologies? Uh, do they merit uh, being entities or not? And that's part of a manuscript that he co-authored with several prestigious experts in the field, including Dr. Mahul Amin, who is the senior author, and Dr. Eva Kompera. So thank you, Gladell, for accepting my invitation, and I look forward to this discussion. Thank you, George, for the warm uh, introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me to write this manuscript on this controversial uh, intraurothelial lesions and also for inviting me for this podcast. And I know that you yourself is a well-known expert in this area. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, conversation. I'm, I'm going to play the <laughs> honest broker here. So that's my role as a podcast host. And then maybe afterward, we can duke it out on how we should call these. So uh, it's, it's going to be fun. But let's start with uh, setting the stage uh, by just talking what, how did these terminologies come about, uh, a little bit on each, uh, each of these entities. And uh, more like in a historic perspective, how they keep evolving, dropping off, dropping in the WHO <laughs> and uh, any analogies uh, you can help our audience to to understand what we're talking about. So the concept of um, dysplasia or this uh, pre-malignant lesions in the bladder is not a new thing. And actually, this uh, the word dysplasia has been used uh, way back in the 1980s already. And um, also the word hyperplasia, even before that, in the 1970s by COS. And really, um, in terms of this classification, I think it's all started um, in the 1998 uh, W um, ISOP consensus, where um, this um, terminologies uh, that includes uh, this controversial uh, flat hyperplasia, dysplasia, and the, the atypia of unknown significance was codified. And that was based on um, the paper two years prior to that by um, uh, Amin et al. And then um, subsequently, these entities was codified in the 2004 WHO, uh, where they are actually, in the, interestingly, in the WHO 2004, they were covered as separate chapters. They are, there's there's the, the devoted chapters for these entities. Now, the interesting thing is that in the 2000... Which, uh, which I want to explain to the audience. When, when something has a devoted chapter, that means that entity made it. Uh, just, rather than just being mentioned in introduction or under another chapter. So just to explain what you meant by that. Oh, thank you, George. And then, uh, interestingly, in the 2016 WHO, there's a, a terminology change for flat hyperplasia where it was lumped with the so-called papillary urethral hyperplasia. It's merged into what we, uh, was called as U-pump, urethral proliferation of unknown malignant potential. And this was actually codified and made it to the list of tumors in the 2016s. And also dysplasia was codified then. Now, fast forward, and I think this um, controversy really has is, is timely as it has ramification and it went into the WHO 2022. If you allow me, George, to say it. <laughs> so the controversy is there and there's a major, major change in the new WHO where dysplasia is now dropped in the list and there's no chapter devoted to it, but it's mentioned there under the chapter of CIS and also flat hyperplasia, which is basically part of U-pump. The U-pump is now dissolved 
no longer part of uh, the tumor list in the WHO 2022. So this is, these are major changes. And, um, you know, and the background of this is that, of course, there's controversy behind these entities. Like uh, always, you know, WHO classification meetings are, are uh, that's not restricted to GU, of course, uh, but uh, it's always full of controversy. The good news is, is if you're looking at, at your table one, which I refer the authors to, you can see that we're having less and less entities and less nomenclatures and things are dropping off. Uh, at the time of the publication, the 2022 was not uh, yet uh, uh, published, but uh, but you alluded to, we don't even have dysplasia, we don't even have you pump. Some of us love that, but some uh, are going back and, and, and discussing, so what are we going to do with these lesions? And I'm hoping today with your uh, masterful uh, guidance, we're going to know exactly what to do with these lesions. And maybe by the time of 2022, Six, we have some studies uh, to show this is where we should settle. So, if, if, I, I, if I can add, ahead. George, to that, uh, the interesting thing you mentioned about this, uh, the, the longer list before, is before we used to stratify dysplasia and now we contracted it into one, and this single entity now is even being questioned. What a change. <laughs> but there is irrational without that. It's not, I mean, these things don't happen just uh, like any other uh, field, just uh, because uh, whoever happens to be on that uh, editorial board uh, decided to drop. Uh, they usually try, uh, the group try to do an honest, uh, evidence-based, uh, why these things should move uh, to an entity or drop as an entity. So uh, let's focus on dysplasia and uh, and uh, and uh, feel free even for the other two entities to, to describe how, when do you use these things, or even in the past, uh, base, what's is there a criteria for each one, and uh, at least in your own practice? Yeah, so it's interesting that when dysplasia was introduced back in, the, in 1998, the definition hasn't changed, really. It's still the same. It's uh, basically um, the cytologic and architectural features are felt Felt, felt. To, be, to, be, to be neoplastic, but it's short of the threshold for CIS. But the problem there is the word felt. It kind of infuses subjectivity. And that's really the problem of dysplasia. And, you know, uh, dysplasia, as most experts will know, it has a problem in terms of re reproducibility. But in terms of its usage, I personally use the diagnosis of dysplasia. And as we know, uh, we encounter dysplasia primarily in the setting of secondary dysplasia. That is uh, after the diagnosis of um, previous um, urotelial neoplasia. And then these are encountered usually on surveillance cystoscopy or uh, RTUR after the diagnosis of uh, urotelial neoplasia. Dysplasia rarely is encountered in the de novo setting. And the primary reason that it's not encountered is that because dysplasia has no clinical, they don't manifest with clinical symptoms. So that's why, you know, they are, when patients present with hematuria, usually they are more in the advanced stage, at least at the CIS level. So dysplasia is missed in the de novo. And a word of caution there is that when you are making a first time diagnosis of dysplasia without a prior neoplasia, you have to be very cautious in making a diagnosis of the novel dysplasia because these are usually encountered in the secondary um, setting um, wherein the patient already have a prior diagnosis of a reutrial neoplasm, either papillary or CIS. Correct. Very well said. So uh, I like that. And, and this is a major problem that many of us have, uh, a lesion that felt to be changes that are felt you know, there's a lot of feelings in it, uh, and uh, that that and it falls short of CIS. And and if we can, uh, you know, uh, weigh in in terms of why in the 2022 uh, the the consen the consensus or the whatever uh, the the idea that uh, that we went along with is this is not an entity. If if you're defining it by uh, falling short of another entity. So we just talk about CIS, and in the chapter of CIS, we talk that if 
Some people have used the term dysplasia if they didn't feel 100% that the entity meets the criteria for CIS. So I think most people are, are on board that CIS is more reproducible, that the criteria is, uh, is uh, more solid. Uh, of course, like anything else is a spectrum, but people felt for dysplasia is even less so, and, and that was the rationale to drop it from uh, having its own chapter. But I want to circle back to what you said. You were saying, you're right, there is no symptoms. That's why you don't primarily, you don't diagnose dysplasia or catch it so many times. But in your paper, you talk about the new advances in cystoscopy, mainly blue light. And so you want to weigh in on that because this is a very pertinent point. Yeah. So, so um, you know, these entities were um, introduced um, three decades ago, but, you know, we have um, advancement in our practice. Um, so as uh, George mentioned first in the practice, in our practice. So um, there's a, uh, advancement in the cystoscopic techniques now the, with this narrow band imaging and then the use of this blue light uh, fluorescence you know so they may pick up this early lesions and then of, of course the um, adoption of the surveillance protocols you know so um, for patients who have diagnosis with um, an invasive uh, papillary ureter carcinoma they have a survey they're under surveillance protocol for at least five years and um, yearly cystoscopy. So early lesions can be picked up in that. And then the third is that there's also a change in the practice in that um, now it's standard to do a re TUR, repeat TUR or restaging re TUR for um, <clears throat> high-grade um, non-invasive papillary uterine carcinoma. And in the process of restaging, um, you know, early uh, phase of the lesion can al may also be captured by that procedure. And also, uh, George, there's also advancement, as you know, in um, in the uh, understanding of the genomics of urothelial mucosa. And uh, now we, um, uh, especially in, you know, in um, the genomics in uh, field effects, you know, um, um, this clonal uh, proliferation of normal appearing urothelium that may have some um, uh, molecular alterations there. And of course, you know, the changes uh, in the transformation to malignancy. So, you know, so with this new uh, knowledge and um, advancement in the technique of uh, detection, so, you know, maybe it's time, you know, it's it's really important to reappraise our understanding of these lesions. Of course, as as, as, my, as I'm, I might like to emphasize that um, we are really kind of working on limited datas, and that's been the problem, limited data on these entities. And not only that, but it's hard to extrapolate all these data through the years because of the changing criteria. And then, of course, the variability in the interpretation or the diagnosis of these entities. <clears throat> uh, very well said. So you, you, you kind of touch upon, because uh, this is an article that we, uh, in this series of controversies in pathology, where we try to invite authors uh, from both sides of the argument and uh, where they put the pros and cons. Uh, so uh, uh, it, uh, the idea is that these entities need further studies and, and hopefully this will spin, you know, these series of controversies will lead to more better evidence down the road. But, but in the article for every one of these entities, you eloquently list the pros for keeping that terminology and the cons for that terminology. And uh, so you touched a little bit about dysplasia by by saying, you know, the pros is now there's early detection. Can you, ex uh, and and uh, by, by this blue light, for example, so you're discovering lesions that would have not been discovered and those maybe have that morphologic features. So that kind of give you uh, a place to go to, right, in between. What other pros for having the diagnosis of dysplasia? So uh, um, the other pros is, um, so one is, of course, as I mentioned, sh potential saliency with the new techniques. The other is that, uh, and we, we have not covered about this, and this may have some ramification of the way we diagnose dysplasia, is that um, the adoption of this morphologic analogy with the papillary um, tumors, which is really, personally, I really like this analogy because it simplifies things. And to kind of briefly um um, describe it is basically uh, the papillary and the flat lesions are analogous in terms of morph morphology. That uh, if you have a high grade papillary carcinoma as a papillary lesion, the flat counterpart morphologically will be CIS. And then the low grade papillary urothelial carcinoma as a papillary lesion, as a flat lesion, it will be the dysplasia morphologically. And then the pun lump 
uh, as a papillary lesion has a hyperplasia appearing urothelium and in a flat lesion it's analogous to basically hyperplasia flat hyperplasia so i really like this um analogy now going back to one of the pros of using dysplasia so this george there's no data on this but this might help us kind of enhance our reproducibility i don't know but but the fact that we accept low grade papillary urethral carcinoma to a certain degree of reproducibility as an entity using the same morphologic criteria so we may be able to extrapolate this morphological analysis uh, um, you know reproducibility of low grade papillary carcinoma and extrapolate it to dysplasia so you know the, of course there's no data on this but this is a recent change and um so you know so there's there's a promise there at least from the morphologic diagnosis now um another pros and but this is really kind of a Limited is that um, there are old studies, and I'm talking here about studies like about 20 years ago, um, which followed de novo dysplasia, and there's really progression to carcinoma. Uh, I think around 14 to 19 percent of those de novo dysplasia. But you know, I mean, these are older studies, so this is like a there's a scholarship gap here. And you know, and for our young audience or you know interested in doing research, this this is gonna be a gap, you know, that have to fill. So there's really a scholarship gap here. So. And of course, uh, George, um, the other thing that, you know, um, for the concept of dysplasia, the concept of dysplasia is well accepted in other organs. You know, we know that there's squamous dysplasia, glandular dysplasia. Why not in the bladder? Why not in the urothelium? And there should be, you know, ca cancer should start somewhere, mm -hmm. right? They should start somewhere. So there, it should be also there in the bladder. They're having, you know, so it sets the other organ dysplasia sets precedence for the bladder acceptance as well. And of course, one is that it's kind of really more on the practical side is that if we have a diagnosis of dysplasia, then it has this um, buffer, buffer diagnosis, right? If you have only like normal and then you have CIS, then it is, uh, uh, there's this, um, uh, borderline buffer category. And there's only one study actually uh, review the diagnosis of dysplasia by uh, non-expert pathologists, and they, I think, they changed the diagnosis to CIS in about one fifth of the cases, and that's significant. So that's that's kind of helpful in a way, you know, for uh, for the diagnosis. So those you are can argue. I mean, you can argue if twenty percent are reclassified, that that's that's a problem. But we'll come to the cons. But very well said. And, uh, and and that's exactly why this terminology endures, even if it's, as I mentioned, uh, under uh, CIS. But it's, uh, you had the point. And I fully agree with you. Uh, and uh, the audience will love me because it's an area that I practice every day. Uh, my, own, my own practice is it, when I used to call dysplasia, I don't call dysplasia anymore. Uh, so I, I'm more in tune with the 2022. Uh, but uh, but I say that I'm worried about some neoplastic lesion and I give a descriptive. Uh, I either call CIS or uh, benign reactive. And then for the in-between, I don't use the dysplasia as escape, but it's a very legitimate argument. But for especially what you mentioned about the analogy, I think this is a good starting point to tell people well, if, if these cytologic changes equate with what you call low-grade papillary, those are the ones in the flat lesion that you should. And if those were on a papillary lesion enough to call it high-grade, then you should call it CIS. So I think it's a very good uh, starting point, but will remain to see if this becomes more reproducible that way. And if that becomes uh, more, more importantly, it has clinical ramification, uh, because as you mentioned, especially in the secondary dysplasias, those could be residual shoulder lesions, right? So uh, so you want to touch upon the cons, starting with the shoulder lesions issues. <laughs> so, so yeah, so um, uh, in relation to that, so the, regarding the cons, you know, so because it's a shoulder lesion, it's encountered in the novel setting. So that's really question the clinical actionability of finding dysplasia, what to do with it if we see it. So, you know, the patients, first of all, the patients are is put on surveillance protocol because of an earlier diagnosis of carcinoma. So it's already being followed based on that finding. So the finding of dysplasia during the interim will not really alter any of um, the, the management for, for that patient. And um, dysplasia can be seen in the TUR as the edge of a prior dissected 
um, high grade or even low grade papillary urothelial carcinoma, and that's not an uncommon scenario. And actually, you know, um, it's actually um, also a pros, if you will, because uh, it tells you that you are um, sampling the residual um, lesion by finding um, dysplasia in the prior T- TUR site. Although as a con, you know, that this finding really doesn't have a clinical meaning. Correct, because you're, this is not a new lesion. You're just re, re, uh, re, re, resecting the residual lesions. Yes. And uh, if you want me to go further about the, the cons, George, so I think really what uh, the major um, con for the dysplasia is the reproducibility. And that's really a big problem. And um, it's interesting that when we were going, when we're going through this, um, writing this manuscript, you know, we have to review the previous publication, and then we were looking at the images. We ourselves as authors, you know, kind of arguing, no, that's that's, that's CIS, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, so we, we cannot, you know, it, it's just interesting that we ourselves kind of, you know, are kind of questioning the previous um, images, and so that's one. And um, when it comes to the diagnosis of dysplasia, we are really limited to the morphologic diagnosis. And we don't have any ancillary studies uh, to use. You know, um, one um, study actually uh, used this panel of CK20, the usual P53 and CD44, but they found actually that in this the setting of dysplasia, it's not that helpful. What's actually helpful uh, as a predictive um, or a, for a prognostication is the patient's prior history of papillary urethral neoplasia, not the findings of that immunochemical panel. So we really don't have ancillaries. And then uh, even for um, mole- uh, looking for molecular art- alterations, as I already alluded to earlier, molecular alteration can all be can also be present or identified in normal appearing urothelium. So we're putting ourselves on a risk if we use molecular alteration as a um, evidence of dysplasia. We're putting ourselves on a risk here that we might be seeing, say, a reactive urothelium with um, molecular alteration. That we, we may overdiagnose it as dysplasia. So that's another con. And um, the other, um, uh, the two um, fact, other factors is that um, you know it's um, rare for de novo dysplasia to be diagnosed. Because of course, as I alluded to earlier, um, de novo dysplasia don't present with symptoms. So, you know, so if we're having an entity that is rarely identified, you know, so it's, you know, um, the uh, in the difference in, so in bladder cancer, I said, unlike colonic cancer, there's a screening, um, you know, where we can pick up these pre-malignant lesions. In the bladder, we don't have a screening. Um, cystoscopy. So we, we might miss this dysplasia. We will not be able to diagnose this de novo dysplasia uh, in the bladder. So that's another um, con for um, dysplasia. And lastly, um, in the setting of um, secondary dysplasia, um, uh, as already mentioned, is that there's really, you know, it doesn't really change the management um, if this is identified in during surveillance um, in a surveillance setting, you know, uh, patients with prior neoplasia because the management is already being dictated by the previous um, diagnosis of urothelial neoplasia. Amazing. You're, uh, you mentioned every single one that you wrote in the paper. You memorized the paper. I, uh, I hope you reviewed it yesterday. That's not how your memory is because that's really intimidating. Uh, you're amazing, Gladell. You're doing great to the field. And uh, so, but uh, to leave our audience with something now that we confuse them uh, enough. Uh, and for our audience, the confusion is just. Right now, you're like us. We're confused about, uh, we don't agree with each other. We don't agree with ourselves when we call dysplasia versus CIS sometimes. Uh, and that was the rationale for my approach is, is I'm not going to stick a neoplastic diagnosis, especially in a primary setting, if I'm not 100% sure. And uh, so that that's how I use the escape. I, I describe a typical urothelial, cannot rule out CIS, uh, which... Uh, a piece that we need to mention is how you communicate to your urologist exactly. and your local urologist will, will know what you mean. And as long as they know, this is what I mean, this could be that old dysplasia or I, I last months I used to call it dysplasia, or this could be CIS, go ahead and, and do what you have to do. Uh, I think that's extremely important, but can you share with the audience 
what uh, the group of authors, uh, including yourself, uh, you know, left in the paper. What what the recommendation for clinical practice right now, uh, and how you you would approach it, or you recommend is a, is a decent option or two of how to address these regions. So, um, so um, some of us, you know, um, make a diagnosis of dysplasia, and um, the dysplasia in Vegas is mostly in the secondary setting and we're very cautious and i advise the audience also to very be very cautious in making a diagnosis of de novo dysplasia now um there's some problem with reproducibility of dysplasia but we believe that there are also dysplasia bona fide dysplasia cases that can be diagnosed and these are have changes that are you know that are subtle or mild you know, mild uh, disorganization, mild loss of polarity, mild nuclear changes. Um, you know, uh, mitosis is not that high, and they are they don't have these features. And this is very important is to make a distinction that they are not um, they are less than what is uh, you have to make a diagnosis of CIS. And for CIS, that's different. You have Markley morphism, brisk mitotic activity, florid nucleomegaly, etc. Now, um, since, you know, dysplasia is controversial, very controversial, it's difficult to diagnose, our advice is that when you're making dysplasia, a diagnosis of dysplasia, uh, check first the history, make sure that you're in the secondary setting. That kind of gives you uh, more space to wiggle that you probably you are allowed to diagnose the dysplasia at that setting. And then second is since this is, contro- this is controversial, you know, and there's some issue with the reproducibility, we advise to show it, it's better to show it to another colleague or maybe in a consensus, um, uh, you know, a department consensus meeting to before you make this, before you render the diagnosis of dysplasia. And of note, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have ancillary um, um, uh, aid to make a diagnosis of dysplasia. So don't use immunostains to make a distinction between dysplasia or um, CIS because it's not going to be helpful. Very helpful. So uh, 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 with that note, uh, uh, it's just I want to wrap it up and saying the good news is in the secondary setting, and that's why you're being liberal in the secondary setting, is not going to affect the management because the management is dictated by the prior diagnosis. It's in the primary setting that is because you're hinting this person may have CIS or may progress to CIS, it's a bigger deal. So that's where you have to be even extra, extra cautious. And maybe you choose uh, to just admit and and give it a descriptive and say, I'm worried about CIS, wait till the inflammation subside, repeat the biopsy. Uh, so the ramification, clinical ramification, if people follow the approach that you just described, uh, will be uh, non-harmful and hopefully will, uh, by by using the analogy to low-grade papillary, maybe uh, we can have some uh, better criteria going forward and maybe one day we'll bring it back as a chapter to the WHO. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, George, if, if you allow me to quote, you know, uh, this is a study by my co-author, uh, Stephen Smith. You know, so we basically surveyed about 45 expert uh, geopathologists internationally, 45, uh, and it's interesting that um, 83% endorse the concept of dysplasia, that it's relevant to the pathogenesis. Relevant, it exists to the pathogenesis. But only a little bit more than half endorse it for use in clinical practice. <laughs> so there's the divide, you know. So, right. so and I, I think overall, George, you know, writing this um, pros and cons, and um, I basically, when I process this, I ended up, in, I'm stuck in the middle really about this. So I think the decision of the WHO 2022 to have it removed, I think it's it's fair at this point. And I think it's fair to say that we really need additional studies on dysplasia. And for the audience who are listening right now, they are young uh, colleagues. Um, the studies that we need is especially in the setting of de novo dysplasia to understand this more, you know, not only about its, um, you know, um, diagnos- diagnostic um setting but also in you know in the molecular in the scientific scientific concept of dysplasia basically 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to have you uh, as our guest today, and, and I'm sure we're going to have you again for other controversial issues. Uh, I'm hinting to <laughs> our recent meeting in uh, 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 prior to the European Society Congress uh, of Pathology, where uh, uh, there was a whole day about uh, ISOP, uh, looking at the grading of papillary lesions and, and the topic we just talked about. So I'm sure more, more publications will follow uh, uh, and uh, we'll be uh, pleased to have you uh, and your co-authors back. So long, everyone. Thank you. Any opinions expressed in this podcast are the speaker's own and do not represent the views of modern pathology, Springer Nature, UAB, or USCAP. Your ModPath chat host and scientific director is Dr. George Neto. Producers are Christina Crow, Amber Jackson, Dr. Sarah Jang, and Dr. Catherine Ketchum. Technical direction is provided by Kaminsky Productions, music by Mitch Neubauer. Thanks to the authors, reviewers, and editors of Modern Pathology for making this podcast possible.